question. Can you read that into the record, please? Essentially, the study did not really show Paxil was effective in treating adolescent depression, comma, which is not something we want to publicize. We asked him, with that information now, you know, how can you s tell us that it would be okay and safe to give a kid Paxil? And he couldn't answer the question. He, he sat back, he put his he head in his hands, and for, you know, the longest two minutes sat there silent. During the last two years of his Paxil study, Keller personally pocketed a million dollars in drug company money, none of which he disclosed in his published research. When people look at uh, the field of psychiatry and they hear all these reports in the New York Times and Boston Globe and, and they see this psychiatrist or this psychologist, you know, uh, took money and didn't disclose it. Um, and uh, they wonder, well, is this causing a biases, you know, in the field? I think that's a legitimate concern of the public because of the fact that it is true. With this level of corruption pervading the testing of psychotropic drugs, one is left with the question, where are those who are entrusted with our protection? Government regulators are supposed to watch out for patients' welfare. So why are so many dangerous psychotropic drugs being allowed on the market? At one point, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration was considered the gold standard in drug safety. But this is no longer the case with psychotropic drugs, where psychiatrists and drug companies have virtually taken over the approval process. FDA drug advisory panels that recommend the approval of psychotropic drugs have long been filled with psychiatrists with financial ties to drug companies. One study showed that 92% of FDA advisory meetings in the last decade included at least one member with conflicts of interest. In response to the accusation of conflict of interest, the FDA says that they have tried to find mental health experts without drug industry connections, but can't locate any. To solve this, they issue waivers, where a psychiatrist is allowed to sit on a psychotropic drug advisory panel, despite having a financial conflict of interest of up to $50,000 a year with drug companies. The advisory panels that review drugs, most of these people are direct recipients of money from uh, usually the, the, the drug under study, the company that's submitting the drug, and they waive the conflicts most of the time. So it, it's really, it's pretty pervasive and it's quite insidious. insidious. Full waivers have been granted to the following participants. Dr. Andrew Leon for his role as a member for, for, of a data safety monitoring board for an affected firm. He receives between $10,001 and $50,000 per year. Dr. Bruce Pollock has been granted a limited waiver for his activities on an advisory board and speakers bureau for an affected firm in which he receives less than $10,001 per year. Ms. Jean Bronstein for her ownership of stock and a bond in an affected firm in which, she val in which the value falls between $50,001 and $100,000. You could be paid massive amounts of money by the drug companies you know, in this sense, and then turn your head here and say, okay, now I'm going to review the drug. And that huge conflict of interest was not to be discussed. In fact, they didn't want people putting it out there. That was the policy. Um, so they still allow it. They still allow that conflict to continue. But now it's meant to, you know, I guess uh, they're supposed to acknowledge if there's a conflict of interest. But acknowledging the conflict and, and getting rid of the conflict are two different things. The revolving door between government, academia, and the drug industry is one of psychiatry's worst kept secrets. There's a revolving door, FDA and drug, FDA and drug. So we have a, a system where, where the, those uh, institutions that um, people trust, want to trust, would like to trust, are truly untrustworthy. Case in point, Daniel Troy, a former drug company lobbyist who was then hired as general counsel for the FDA. 
where he filed legal briefs in favor of drug companies and against drug victims. He was the drug lobbyist lawyer, and then he became the, the, the general counsel uh, of the FDA. I mean, they talk about having uh, uh, the wolf walk, watch the chickens. After leaving the FDA, Daniel Troy went back to the drug industry, where he is now senior vice president and general counsel for pharmaceutical giant GlaxoSmithKline. This is the atmosphere under which psychiatrists at the FDA give drug makers approval to sell psychotropic drugs. But the clinical trials are not supposed to end here. There is one final stage of testing to go, phase four. Phase four requires that drug companies track the adverse side effects that will undoubtedly occur in the general public, well beyond the very small samples of phase three. The sheer number of side effects that will now emerge has prompted one advocacy group to warn that most drug safety problems will not show up until the drug has been on the market for at least seven years. The meds are not tested long term before they get approval from the FDA. The, the studies tend to be a matter of weeks or a few months, but nothing looking at over the years. And the data that's coming in now from Europe and also in the United States uh, is that uh, the side effects are deadly. Instead of serving a safety function as post-marketing surveillance, phase four clinical trials are now being recast as post-marketing research and repurposed into a means of testing psychotropic drugs for additional psychiatric disorders. Take Zoloft. FDA approved in 1991 to treat major depression. Since then, it has also been okay to treat obsessive compulsive disorder, post-traumatic stress disorder, premenstrual dysphoric disorder, panic disorder, and social anxiety disorder. In 2005, the last full year before it lost its patent, Zoloft grossed $3.3 billion. And as with other psychotropic drugs, much of that is pure profit. 100 Xanax pills, for example, only cost two and a half cents to manufacture, but retail on average for $136.79, a profit of well over 500,000%. It is for this reason that drug companies enjoy profit margins of about 16%, triple the norm of most businesses. In 2006, drug company CEOs of the 10 leading drug companies were paid an average of $18 million a year, almost 400 times the median household income of the average American family. Investors also love pharmaceutical companies producing psychotropic drugs, since psychiatrists never prescribe them to cure mental problems, but to manage them, often for a lifetime and lifetime customers have a huge impact on the bottom line. As one stock analyst famously commented, the first disaster is if you kill people, the second disaster is if you cure them. Pharmaceutical company stock has been one of Wall Street's most consistent winners and is widely considered one of the most profitable investments one could make. In 2002, the total profits of the top 10 drug companies in the Fortune 500 exceeded the combined profits of the other 490 businesses. And a downturn in pharmaceutical stock prices would constitute major losses for investors throughout the world, and investments must be protected. With so much money at stake, is it any wonder that stockholders are never told the truth about the drugs they are investing in? They are unaware that FDA approval does not guarantee drug safety and that the clinical trials justifying that approval are frequently based on falsities and deceptions. But once the drug is approved, the next challenge is, how do you convince prescribing physicians that these drugs are truly safe, effective, and carrying few side effects when the drug company's own trials prove that this is not the case? As powerful psychoactive substances, psychotropic drugs are available only through the prescription of a medical doctor. So how did psychiatrists and drug companies succeed in convincing millions of doctors to prescribe them to hundreds of millions of people?